Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the show for thinking people, where we explode the many modern myths of today by questioning important aspects of the mainstream view. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt, and on the show today, we are looking at the myths and the dogma surrounding cancer. And uh, joining me to discuss this is uh, Dr. Thomas Seyfried. He is a professor of biology at Boston College, Yale University, USA. Professor Seyfried has, I believe, well over 150 scientific peer-reviewed papers to his name, and many of them about cancer. And also he has um, published a book in 2012, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease on the Origin, Management and Prevention of Cancer. And uh, this is the work that we should be focusing on with our discussion today. Professor Seafried, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, a very warm welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Nigel. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Great. Maybe you could uh, give us some sort of introduction by telling us a little bit about your research and with maybe with respect to how you've sort of picked up the ball from Otto Warburg um, and his research from last century. Because um, I've, I've heard you say yourself, this is not necessarily a new idea, but you've, you've uh, obviously developed his ideas. Yeah, what we've done is essentially uh, expanded his original work um, and identified aspects of what, of what uh, was confusing to him um, and moved it forward uh, with the new knowledge that we have uh, with respect to the origin of cancer. You know, basically Otto Warburg uh, said from his many publications that cancer arose from damage to the respiration of the cell. And, um, and this would force the cell to, in order to survive, it would have to use an ancient heirloom pathway called fermentation um, in order to survive. And that origin was the, was the direct result of some sort of impairment or damage to the ability of the cell to breathe air and get energy from, from, from respiration. Because, you know, as we all breathe air, we get respiration. We, our energy comes from our breathing. If we stop breathing for a, a period of time, we'll be dead. Um, cancer cells live uh, without oxygen. And that's, this is one of their uh, general characteristics that we see all cancer cells can live in the absence of oxygen. So, um, so the question is, how is it po where did that come from and how is it possible that they can do that? And that's what Warburg was uh, wrestling with. So, you know, in our work, we, we came about uh, this from a very different perspective because we had been studying ketogenic diets for epilepsy and uh, we had been studying um, calorie restrictions for epilepsy and and things like this. And then we, we have, we've been developing brain tumors and various kinds of cancers, but it, it was more for biochemical studies, not for looking at the origin of the disease. So our, our, our approach to this problem came from more of a biochemical uh, lipid analysis of lipids. So, um, but it came clear to us that when we put some of these mice that had brain tumors on calorie restricted diets, the tumor shrunk dramatically. And, um, you know, at first we didn't, you know, it had been known that calorie restriction shrinks tumors. But the question is how, why is calorie restriction shrink, shrink tumors? And then we showed um, that it lowers the blood sugar. And uh, lowering blood sugar is uh, what Warburg, was set, Warburg had said, is that these tumor cells are dependent heavily on, on glucose for survival. So if you calorie restrict, you lower blood sugar and the tumors get smaller. And um, so the question became, and we did some beautiful studies uh, showing a direct correlation between the level of blood sugar and how fast the tumor would grow. And then we would say, well, well, this is interesting. Did any, and of course, it links perfectly with, uh, with Otto Warburg said. So the question came, I mean, it's uh, the cancer needs uh, fermentation fuels. And the fuel that is one of the, the key fuels is glucose. So if glucose is in low supply, cancer cells can't grow very fast. It's just a very simple connection, all linking back to Otto Warburg. But the, the ketogenic diet is a, is a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. And we knew from our work with epilepsy that normal cells can burn ketones. But then when we started to study cancer cells, we realized that they can't burn ketones 
because they have defective respiration. And that's what Warburg said, that they have defective respiration. That's the reason why they need glucose. But uh, many other people had also recognized that glutamine is another fuel um, that uh, the, 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 the Warburg knew nothing about glutamine or its role in, in energy metabolism. Mm -hmm. but, but the field, uh, uh, and what caused the great mystery in the field was people thought that um, cancer cells uh, ferment glucose, but at the same time have normal respiration. And this makes no sense in the idea of biology and biochemistry. Sure. But okay, well, well um, excuse me for interrupting you, uh, Professor, but perhaps we'll get back to that. If I can just um, zoom out for a moment, just to uh, set the scene um, for our, our viewers and listeners. Uh, many people recall that uh, way back in 71, I think it was, that, uh, you know, the, the famous declaration of war on cancer um, is, is uh, uh, you know, the, it was declared a high priority. And since then, billions of dollars and pounds have been spent um, on, on the research towards uh, along the lines of this uh, conventional approach, which you're, 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 uh, you, you shall no doubt come to expand upon, and all these drug treatments. So there's a huge amount of inertia with research going in, in one direction. And uh, the other fact is that almost everyone these days knows somebody who's died of cancer or who is suffering from cancer. Um, right. And cancer causes more than a quarter of all UK deaths. I'm not sure what the statistic is for the States, which amounts to about 450 deaths a day. Um, and also um, the UK Cancer Research website um, informs us that um, upwards of 22,000 people die each day all around the world from cancer. So, so just to, uh, I just wanted to, to get some perspective on the scale of, of this problem. Um, so inevitably the war on cancer is, is being lost and, and uh, we need to ask some root questions to, to, to you know, reassess where we are. And, and fantastically, this is, this is what you have been doing. Um, so, Professor Seavey, could, could you um, initially give us a, like a, a snapshot of this conventional mainstream view of cancer as a genetic disease? Uh, and then maybe we can go on to contrast it um, yeah. you know, more yeah. with, the, with the Warburg view. Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think you, you touched upon a very important point, which is the number of people dying. Um, in our country, it's over 1,600 people a day in the United States. <clears throat> I just came back from China where cancer has a surpassed heart disease as the number one killer in, in the Chinese population. Um, it's running rampant. Uh, and not only are the new cases increasing, but the, the amount of deaths are increasing as well. So what that says that that, you know, as I say, I use this, I use the data when I give lectures and I say the report card on this disease is very bad. It's a F, it's a failure. Okay. Absolutely. And um, the main reason it's a failure is because people, since the war on cancer, uh, have largely considered this a genetic disease. And um, this is the failure. And this is the one of the key reasons why we have so many people dying from the disease. It's misunderstood. The origin of the disease is fundamentally misunderstood by the majority of people that work in the field. And this explains why. So cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. It is not a genetic disease, all right? So I've published papers on this. However, this statement that I just made is, is so difficult for people to uh, accept. Um, mainly because they have been so locked into a dogmatic view that cancer is a genetic disease, it, it's a, it prevents them from entertaining or even wanting to look at the data that argues against their fundamental dogmatic view. Sure. You know, dogma, I, I consider dogma an extremely powerful force on the human mind. You know, we have dogmatic, dogmatic views are part of religion. Uh, they're part of, uh, of political uh, ideologies and these kinds of things. Very powerful force on the ability to think rationally Absolutely. about it. They seem, so, to be, they seem to be parked somewhere marked unquestionable. <laughs> yes. Well, a dogma is an irrefutable truth. You don't question the foundations of your very religious beliefs. You know, the, a, a religion is a dogmatic view of, of the world according to a particular script. Yeah. Well, in, in, in biology, we have the same thing. There are dogmatic views on how, how cer certain things should, should occur. And when all the research or the majority of research is focused on uh, a, a misunderstanding of what the nature of the disease is, the result we have 
is a disease out of control. Uh, it's clear why there's very little advance in cancer is because there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what the nature of the disease is. Otto Warburg had that known, but his work was pushed aside all over the um, euphoria about genetic mutations. So, uh, yeah, and this is, so people are still chasing uh, mutations. It's like the dog chasing his tail. It, it, we're getting nowhere. We're spending a lot of energy and getting nowhere. But once you realize that the origin of the disease is, is, is a fundamental disruption of respiration with compensatory fermentation, now there's a clear programmable strategy to uh, drop death rates and suffering by enormous numbers. Sure. So what is the evidence that uh, that you can uh, <clears throat> point to to back up um, you know, your assertion? Is it, is it essentially the uh, nuclear transfer ex experiments and your work done around collating those? Is that, is that the core well, of the evidence? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it wasn't... Uh, all I did was take uh, a number of, of, of disparate observations from the cancer field over many decades and, um, and put them together in a single uh, paper and then reinterpret the observations from those experiments in light of two competing arguments for the origin of the disease. In other words, do these nuclear and mitochondrial transfer experiments that were done by the most competent scientists on the planet, very leaders in the field, um, they, they were just asking you know, whether or not a cancer nucleus could, could regulate development. They weren't asking whether or not their observations would support a mitochondrial metabolic theory or a genetic theory, because the, it was already determined that cancer is a genetic disease. So, and it was very interesting because some of those nuclear transfer experiments, the very scientists that did those experiments were, were torn because they said it seems like the results from these experiments do not support the genetic theory. But they, but they didn't say much about it because they when you have a dogmatic view, you never question dogma. Dogma sure. is not to be questioned. It's supposed to be accepted. So, so, so um, there was only one of the nuclear transfer experiments that, that actually said uh, in the paper that, you know, these experiments seem to ex uh, support Warburg's theory more than they support the, gene, the, the idea that cancer is a genetic disease. So there clearly was one, pay, one that knew that. Uh, but they again d d discounted. So these these studies were dispersed through the literature over a number of decades, and what I simply did was bring them all together in a single paper, and then look, very carefully evaluated the results from each of these experiments. And do the results more uh, more strongly support that cancer is a nuclear genetic somatic mutation disease, mm -hmm. or whether it's a uh, is more consistent with Otto Warburg's theory? Sure. And I think if I think if if you if you look at those data uh, very carefully, uh, you come to the general conclusion that most of those experiments more strongly support Warburg's theory than st support the gene theory. Sure. So, so in, in, if I may interject there, just as a nutshell for, for listeners, is that so these nuclear transfer experiments, and correct me if I'm wrong or elaborate, uh, are essentially taking nuclei from, from cells and transplanting it into the uh, cytoplasm of another cell and, and vice versa to, yes. to, to determine um, if the uh, cancer is caused by a faulty nucleus. If you Surely, if you put that nucleus into a healthy cytoplasm, uh, you know, you'll, you'll expect to see a cancerous cell. Perhaps you can pick up the ball. Yeah, well, exactly. You're exactly right. These are not terribly difficult experiments um, to interpret in light of those kinds of findings. So clearly, when you take the cancerous nucleus and put it into a new cytoplasm with a mito normal mitochondria, you can get normal cells, sometimes normal tissues, and sometimes a whole mouse or a frog cloned from the nucleus of the tumor cell without any evidence of dysregulated cell growth, which is the defining feature of all cancer. All the, the, the phenotype of all cancer is dysregulated cell growth caused by somatic mutations in the nucleus, okay? And that was not seen in these experiments, these experiments. And then when you did the opposite experiment where you took a normal nucleus and put it into the cytoplasm of a tumor cell, you either got dead cells or tumor cells, you never got normal cells. So clearly it was the cytoplasm that was driving the disease and not the nucleus. Okay. Well, this, this is heresy. This, this, is, this undermines the entire view that cancer is a genetic disease. And not only that, more recent studies on genomic sequencing have not found any mutations in some of the most aggressive cancers. No matter how much they've looked, they can't find mutations in some cancers. And then there's other examples where we have 
normal skin cells that supposedly contain all these so-called driver disease, driver genes, but they're in normal cells. So clearly there's so many disconnected uh, parts, but the nuclear transfer experiments are the strongest evidence to date to uh, disprove that cancer is a genetic disease. So once you make that decision, then it becomes nonsense to do most of what's being done in the field. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so all of the, the current standard of care, the, your radiation, your chemotherapy, and your surgery, all of those, uh, and, and in fact, any other options are, are excluded, um, certainly over in this country, I think in the States as well. So those, that is the only care you get that none of those three are, are addressing this mitochondrial cause and indeed would you go as far as to say these these three methods are actually causing further ill health? Oh absolutely there's no question about it I mean we have seen that so many of these poor cancer patients are dying for as much of the treatment as they are from their disease so, th so the question now becomes well if we know the cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease what are the therapies that we use and how do they con how do they contrast with what the standards of care are currently using, okay? Like you've just mentioned, we have radiation, chemo, and we have, we have surgery, mutilation surgery, and now we have some of the new immunotherapies where simply a, 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 they're just a, a, a branch of, of the gene theory. So, so the question is, if all cancers are, are fermenting um, and they, they, they live by fermentation, and what do they ferment? What are the, so it turns out that glucose and glutamine are the two main fermentable fuels for these cells all right okay. they can ferment other things but they're not pr you have in order to drive an inefficient system you have to have a vast supply of fuel because the because the engine is inefficient so an inefficient engine consumes more of the fuel than a very highly efficient engine so the two fuels that are abundant in the microenvironment of tumor cells are glucose and glutamine and the, and the glucose and glutamine are the fermentable fuels that drive the beast. So the easiest way to shut down the cancer is to deprive them of glucose and glutamine. Now, it's very simple to, get to lower glucose because we can use ketogenic diets with insulin therapy and a variety of different drugs. The brain, the body does not need glucose to survive. We can, we can transition to ketone body. So all of our normal cells can be transitioned off to a non-glucose fuel. The tumor cells can't use the ketones because they're defective respiration. So that marginalizes and puts them at a competitive disadvantage. So the bigger issue now becomes how do we target the glutamine? And we use drugs and we use certain procedures because glutamine is a very important molecule in our body. It's a ne necessary for our immune system, urea cycles. It's an extremely important uh, amino acid. So to, to target glutamine, we have to use very strategic procedures and very do it very carefully. So that you close the front door on the glucose, and then you slowly degrade the ability of the tumor to use glutamine. And that, what that does is it absolutely kills these tumor cells without harming the rest of the body. So Amazing. this is it's a very simple procedure. So it, once you, when the time comes at some point in the future, when people realize what a terrible mistake was made, what a tragedy was made in the misunderstanding of cancer and realizing how simple it is to actually manage this disease without harming the patient. Everybody's going to go, what were we doing in all those days? So, so this is coming. It all, it, the problem is that you have to, uh, in some way, get, um, break through the dogmatic view that this is, uh, this is not a genetic disease. And, and that's what's holding back the field. The field is being held back by a dogmatic view that cancer is a genetic disease. And we perpetuate this absurdity. And once you realize the biology and understand the biology of the problem, then the solutions become very clear and very simple and very cost effective. Fantastic. So do you agree then that it's, uh, it's accurate to say that the uh, primary cause of cancer is defective mitochondrial respiration? Is that the right way to phrase it? Yeah, that's exactly what Otto Warburg said. Yeah. Warburg said, now, what causes defective respiration? And that's the oncogenic paradox, which has uh, plagued people from or, or perplexed people from the very beginning. How is it possible that so many provocative agents that we know about could cause cancer through a common pathophysiological mechanism. Do, do you mean do you mean the variety of things such as radiation, carcinogenic yes. compounds, inflammation? Yes, yes. We know that there are cancer-causing viruses. There's radiation. There's a lot of 
um, uh, chemical carcinogens, hypoxia, inflammation, even even the genes that people think are causing, like uh, Lee Fraumeni, uh, uh disease, which is a cancer, the BRCA1 that you hear about in the in the breast cancer. You know, these are all secondary causes. They're not primary causes. Those mutations will cause cancer only if they damage the respiration. Some people have those exact same mutations and never get cancer because the mutation in those people did never never damage the respiration of the two of the cell. Okay, so, 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 so just to be clear here for the listeners, um, it, it's these uh, these triggers of cancer: the radiation, the viruses, the carcinogenic compounds. It's it, what they do is they are compromising the the respiration of the mitochondria, and and then the snowball rolls off down the hill. Absolutely. Okay. And what happens, what happens is the, those chemical carcinogens, radiation, viruses, or age, or whatever it is, they cause the mitochondria to produce these reactive oxygen species, the, the ra radicalized oxygen molecules. And these are carcinogenic and mutagenic. So the mutations that we see in the cancer cells are an effect of the damage to the respiration. They're okay. not the cause, they're in effect. They're downstream. So okay. They're downstream. So this is why targeting all this stuff hasn't worked and why we continue to pile up the poor cancer bodies because none of this, this stuff is all downstream epiphenomena. It's not the, not the problem. The problem is the cells to survive must ferment. And if they don't ferment, they die. So the mutations are uh, largely irrelevant. Now, the, the, the situation is, of course, when the cell can't uh, respire, can't get energy from air. Very interesting. The mitochondria signal to the nucleus to upregulate certain genes, and these genes are transcription factors that open the floodgates for fermentable fuels to get into the cell. So they are facilitators. They're, again, responding to the damage. They're not causing. They're responders. So, so everybody's targeting, trying to target the, 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 um, the responders or the effects, and that's the reason why we have so little progress in this disease. So the simplest way to deal with the problem is simply restrict the availability of the fermentable fuels and the tumor cells die. They can't live on anything else. Okay. They're not adaptable. They're not adaptable. They're very susceptible to disruptions in their in their fermentation pathway. Okay, so so that's uh, I, I, the way I understand it. Conventional um, therapies or, or research is looking at all these thousands of different mutations and trying to find like a needle in a haystack. And and you're saying that uh, if we if we go to the uh, to, to the 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 fuel the the, the yes. metabolizing that's going on inside the cell, all of a sudden we've got one target instead of thousands of targets. Effectively, absolutely, you've got a singular target here. You okay. got a singular target. It's called fermentation. And, though, and we've been show, now our new work is showing that glutamine is, the, is a fermentable amino acid. And this is, this is what has been perplexing the field. They thought glutamine was re being respired, therefore tumor cells have normal respiration. Wrong, glutamine is being fermented. Okay. And what, so it's amino acid fermentation. And this goes back to the, all of the organisms that we had on the planet some two and a half, three billion years ago were fermenters. We had no oxygen in the environment, but yet we had a lot of living organisms, and they were all fermenting. Okay. And they, fer they fermented amino acids and things like this. So these cancer cells are simply falling back on an ancient pathway that existed before oxygen came on the planet. Okay, so I, as I understand it, uh, the human body has, a, has adapted to, a, to burn two fuels, um, essentially sugar or fat. Um, so that's glucose or, or fat and its breakdown products of, of, uh, of ketones. Perhaps you can fill in the yeah. blanks if I'm wrong here. So, so, where, so, so you're saying, or what I'm reading, Gina, what you're saying is that, is that we can reduce sugar, we can bring that one out by controlling diet. Um, yeah. Can you just clarify how we, the only way to uh, reduce the glutamine is, is with other specific drugs, is that other parts of, of I, the therapy? I think, at this, I think that's true. Um, we can't dietarily reduce glutamine. It's, it's the most abundant amino acid in our body. It's, it's released from muscle. It's released from a lot of different organs. It, it's a, such a versatile uh, uh, fuel. And, and when we target glutamine, we have to be very careful because the, our cells of the immune system use glutamine as a primary fuel. So when you're going after okay. glutamine, you have to be very cautious as to not to paralyze or impair our immune system. Because you know our immune system and, and other cells, uh, when we kill tumor cells, those tumor cells remain in the microenvironment as dead bodies, right? They're, 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 they're corp cell corpses, essentially. So you need to remove, uh, the undertaker needs to come in and remove those cells. And, th and that are part of our immune system, which also uses glutamine.
Okay. So we've developed this concept called press pulse, where we uh, we we put the whole body in a press that su suppresses the rate of growth of the tumor cells by depriving them of their glucose, and then we pulse certain procedures to to kill uh, uh, targeting glutamine just pre uh, just a, a short pulse of a glutamine target and then pull it off, and then we use certain kinds of drugs that work together with these diets and hyperbaric oxygen. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen acts like radiation, but it doesn't harm the normal cells. So we kill the tumor cells by the same mechanism as radiation would, but without damaging the normal cells. So we think we can replace the majority of radiotherapy with hyperbaric oxygen. We can replace most of the toxic approaches to cancer management with non-toxic approaches that will be just as efficient. Great. So no need for hair to fall out and all this other stuff that's no, associated. Absolutely not. So so what what those chemo drugs are doing is trying to stop the proliferation of the tumor cells. But they also stop the proliferation of a lot of other cells in our body, in our gut, in our hair. That's why the hair falls out. Your gut, you get sick, you get diarrhea and all these problems. That's because it's indiscriminately trying to stop proliferation. But if I take the fuel away from only the tumor cell and allow all the normal cells to respire, then we can target the tumor cell without harming the rest of the body. And that's what the press pulse therapy is doing. And that's what the, the patients, the humans that we are treating with this therapy are doing remarkably well without the toxic effects that you get from traditional standards of care. Fantastic. So uh, maybe I could just uh, rewind a moment or two just to, to ask you a question about uh, metastasizing or maybe <laughs> if I yeah. pronounce that right. Is, is the glutamine responsible for helping the cancer spread around the body? Is, is that, a, is that a, a key factor? I think, yeah, I think so. We, we think very much so. So we have defined the metastatic cell as a macrophage. So and this is another uh, point of, of, of great um, um, I, I don't know, aston astonishment by the field. In other words, they, they think uh, a series of random mutations will accumulate in some cell, and eventually that cell then starts to spread around the body. Uh, this is nonsense. Um, this is all based on the gene theory, which has been disproven, all right? So yeah. once you disprove the gene theory, that concept of metastasis goes out the window. So what happens is in a cancer, you, you have a, a wound a group of cells are proliferating because of one of these provocative agents in the micro that in the environment that we spoke about, and they and they create a, a kind of an inflammatory focus in, in an organ in a system, and and what happens is our normal immune cells, macrophages, come into this environment to heal the wound. They're designed to heal wounds, but when you have a bunch of cells that are proliferating, the very action of the macrophage provokes that environment. It's doing the it's doing what it's genetically programmed to do, but in a wrong context. Okay. And then what happens, they are fusogenic cells. These macrophages are extremely, the cells of our immune system are very fusogenic. So they start fusing uh, with these neoplastic tumor cells that can't metastasize because they've, they don't have the capability. Macrophages naturally enter and exit our tissues and exist in the circulation and live in hypoxic environments. So that cell now becomes metabolically corrupted. And now you have one of the strongest cells in our body being metabolically corrupted. And it uses both glucose and glutamine to uh, proliferate, enter and exit tissues and spread throughout your whole body. Okay. So it's one of our immune cells that's now corrupted. And it's a very tough cell because it can live in hypoxic environments, which means the entire anti-angiogenic field makes no sense. Okay, so, so, so hy hypoxic environment meaning without oxygen. Yes, yes. So they, they already, they're designed, they're programmed to live. So when we get a big cut on our body or some wound or contusion, we have cells in our body that can get into this hypoxic environment, kill bacteria and heal the wound. Well, that cell now, that cell is our metastatic cell corrupted. So you know how powerful that cell is. And therefore, when you get metastatic cancer, the probability of long-term survival is very, very low. So we're doing, and we treat these poor people with all these toxic drugs, increasing inflammation and creating a perfect environment for the demise of that patient, whether it be lung cancer, brain cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, the very therapies that are used to treat facilitate the, the, the eventual demise of the patient. Well, okay, that's fantastic. So your treatment plan then um, kicks off with uh, dietary intervention to um, get the 
patient into nutritional ketosis. Um, yes. Can you can you talk a little bit about that and how you how you measure it? Because I believe you've developed something called a uh, the, the GKI index. Um, perhaps, perhaps you could yeah, tell us yeah. a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So that you're absolutely right about that. So and we're doing that now. It's um, and it's absolutely unbelievable. So we take the cancer patients and we immediately either do therapeutic fasting or or very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, uh, and we bring the blood sugar down. And uh, and what and we know doing this, we we target the blood the abnormal blood vessels, we reduce the inflammation, um, and we actually start killing some of the tumor cells. So it's an anti-inflammatory, -inflam anti anti-angiogenic. So the patient's tumor starts to already get small, and the patient's physiology. Uh, becomes enhanced. And we use the glucose ketone index as a biomarker system to allow the patient to know when they are in therapeutic ketosis, which is where the blood sugar is low and the ketones are high. Because as I said, the all the cancer cells, they need uh, fermentable fuels. Now, it doesn't target the glutamine so well, but it certainly uh, restricts the glucose. So this, but also shrinks the tumor and makes the tumor much more manageable. Now, we also recommend when the tumor is already shrunken and, all and, it's, and the microenvironment becomes more healed, that surgical resection can, in fact, be potentially curative uh, when uh, the tumor and when the physiology is in that state. You mean literally uh, getting in there and taking it out, cutting yes. it out? Yeah. yeah, as if it were a wart or, or, or a small lesion or something like this. Yeah. So because the tumor has now hunkered down, a lot of it is now becoming restricted from the metabolic therapy itself. And the metabolic therapy can involve hyperbaric. You can do a lot of different things to shrink that tumor down. But if it's still persisting as a, as a, a, a identifiable site on PET or MRI, then, and we know that this tumor has now been bashed by metabolic therapy, then surgeons can in fact uh, resect uh, this lesion and, and potentially cure the patient there at that point. So, so, um, uh, and I think, I think that's going to be where, where the future is going to be for many of these cancers is that we can shrink them down, make them indolent. Now, some of them can be eliminated completely. When we target glucose and glutamine, uh, 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 uh synergistically and simultaneously using press pulse concepts, there is a real c a possibility that we can eliminate the tumor without surgery, without anything. In other words, it'll just disappear because it's very fuels and the health of the body will be contributing toward, towards the, uh, the, the, the removal uh, or, or, of, this, of this lesion. So we don't know, but this is the future. I don't think we need radiation and chemo um, uh, for any great extent because why, why are we doing those to stop the proliferation? Well, we can stop the proliferation by just removing the fuels. So that eliminates the need for that stuff. Why are you doing that? And it's also toxic. Why are you using something that's toxic? And, and you should, why is anybody who has a, 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 a affliction be, be given a, 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 any kind of a therapy that would cause harm, that makes them sick? It's insane. It's, it's nuts. It really if you is irrational, isn't it? If you understand the biology of the problem, you would never do this kind of stuff. The, the ignorance of the field is allowing us to persist with these very toxic f fuel, uh, approaches. So I think our approach in the, in the long run, which is called press pulse metabolic therapy, keto adapted and all this kind of stuff, you know, uh, is, is, is the strategy that will eventually make most of the other cancer therapies obsolete. It's just a matter of time because right. most people would want to do this themselves. They don't want to be poisoned and irradiated to make them healthy. They, 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 they want to know that there's yeah. something else out there uh, that can help them. The, one of the tragedies is we're not training our, our oncologists, our physicians to know about this. It's they don't know anything. One of the most exciting things I think about it is the fact that uh, it, it places much more control in the hands of the patient, in the hands of the ordinary person. When we understand, um, you know, the, the description of cancer, as, as you so eloquently put it, um, we it, all of a sudden, when you when you know that by literally whatever you put in your mouth, you, you can affect your, your future health outcomes so directly, it's, it's very, very empowering. So, so if, once people start reducing their carbs and sugar intake to get into ketosis, um, could you tell us a little bit about this sort of how goes it um, uh, glucose ketone ratio index that you've developed and, and how that can be used by, you know, people like me and listeners who might want to ensure that we don't want cancer. We we never want well, to. Yeah, we never want to come into a situation where we're uh, uh, curing it or trying to uh, manage yeah, right. it. We want to prevent yeah. it. No, you're right. That, that's a, so. Now we're talking about prevention. 
All right, because yeah. obviously if we if we can uh, uh, reduce our risk in the first place, then we don't have to go through all this other stuff in the second place, right? So, so as I said, um, we can't get cancer if our mitochondria in our cells are healthy. It only becomes what we get cancer when only a, 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 a some some cells in a particular organ or tissue uh, develop uh, damage to their res- a chronic. Usually, it's a chronic. Uh, because acute damage to respiration usually will kill the cell, and you can never get a tumor from a dead cell. So it's got to be it's got to be a chronic interruption of respiratory function. So how do we prevent that from happening? And you can that the best way, but the most difficult way is therapeutic fasting. You know, you just stop eating. You just drink water for a week or two. And I, I believe me, I would say the majority of people on our planet. Uh, would have a great deal of difficulty with this. You know, it, it's not easy. Oh, it's great to say it, you know, but try to do it. It's it's a very, it's not easy. You know, people say, and it's, the older you get, the harder it is. Okay. So, so would it be true to say, sorry to interject again this there, but would it be true to say almost literally if you were diagnosed with cancer, almost the best thing you could do would be to stop eating, to, to literally begin a, a one-week fast there and then? Yes. Well, a lot of people are doing that, and, and, and as a matter of fact, that's uh, because that will target the uh, in, the, um, uh, the the cachexia that people get as well, because a lot of people, and that's the other mind. Which is what? Mind. What's cachexia? Cachexia is when you have metastatic cancer, and even though you're eating, you're losing weight. The cancer is making you lose weight, and what's happening is the cancer is 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 using the the uh, uh, protein in your muscle to get the glutamine and fermentable amino acids. <laughs> so it's no, in other words, it's using that to get energy. So, and very interesting, when you have cachexia, blood insulin and glucose are high and you're, lo- and you're losing weight, it's, it's, a compl- it's almost like a diabetic situation. So when you calorie restrict and do therapeutic fasting, blood sugar and the insulin go down. So that puts tremendous pressure on the tumor. And if you're killing tumor cells, the level of cachexia will, will eventually disappear. So you have to play your body organ systems off one another. But you gotcha. have to understand the biology of the system. So that's one of the reasons why people uh, sometimes argue against fasting. And, and they say, oh, no, no, because you're losing weight. You can't lose more weight. by." But the, the whole physiology of the body is changing to a therapeutic state rather than a pathological state. So this is the, fla- the fallacy when you have cancer and cachexia. They say, oh, eat a lot of sugar and carbohydrates so you can gain weight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh -uh. (laughs) Wrong direction. That's insane, man. It's just not, you don't do stuff like that if you understand the biology of the problem. Yeah. So, uh, and that's why we have, you know, you can't, you go down to the cancer uh, uh, oncology centers and they're giving everybody cake and ice cream and Infamel and all these kinds of things, you know, to make them feel better after the chemotherapy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, so the um, again, just wanted to bring back to so on, on prevention, um, the this this ratio that you've you've got between lowering the glucose. So, so uh, and another thing I wanted to ask you also, perhaps we can pick up is is how you measure uh, the ketones in in ketosis. Oh, yeah. um, do, do, what sort of meter do you end up do you, do you uh, recommend using, and, and yeah. how how can we use the knowledge of uh, uh, you know our blood sugar level, which we know from what you said we need to reduce, and our blood ketone level, which similarly we know. We need to elevate. Um, yeah. Can we yeah. tie that well, together? Well, ketones. It was also shown by my 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 my, my late uh, colleague and friend um, George Cahill uh, that and and Bud Veach, uh, Richard Veach still still uh, at at the NIH showed that ketones are a super fuel. So when you burn ketones in our cells, we produce very few reactive oxygen species. It's a pure, beautiful fuel that make our mitochondria extremely healthy. So in order to get the mitochondria to burn ketones, you have to lower the blood sugar. Because if the sugar is there, the sugar will often be, the glucose will be the prime fuel. Unless you lower the sugar, and then the ketones become the prime fuel. So in order to get your mitochondria super healthy, you have to burn ketones. And the way to do that is you have to lower the blood sugar first. And then the ketones will be burned, and the body will get super healthy that way. That's why we call it therapeutic fasting. All right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. or therapeutic ketosis, where the levels of ketones are as high or, or higher than the level of sugar in the blood. And that then causes the organs to burn. And we have that glucose ketone index calculator that we that we developed and allows the patients to know whether they are in therapeutic ketosis or not. So you have people saying, oh, I'm on a ketogenic diet. And they and you say, well, what's your GKI, your glucose? Well, I don't know. I didn't measure it. Well, how do you know you're in therapeutic ketosis if you didn't measure your GKI? 
So this lets people know un without un un ambiguity, you know for certain that I'm in therapeutic ketosis. And if you're in therapeutic ketosis, you're going to significantly reduce your risk for cancer and type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and a lot of these so-called chronic diseases. By entering the, the world of therapeutic ketosis, and I said it's, some people stay in that zone for a long period of time and they, they like it. You know, they, but, you know, I always say it's good to visit there uh, periodically, but uh, sometimes it's hard to live in constantly in therapeutic ketosis. So, but at least allows people to take charge of their health, knowing that if I did this, I'm making my body extremely healthy for a shorter period of a short period of time. And you can feel good about that. Sure. I've also heard it said, uh, I think it might have been uh, Joseph McCullough that said so, uh, that cycling in and out of ketosis can be beneficial, lest uh, with a with a chronically low blood sugar level, your, the liver can kick in and actually uh, start start increasing the blood sugar level. Is that correct? Yeah, well, you'll get gluconeogenesis. Yeah. Um, that's that's built into our uh, into our system. Um, and, uh, you know, that, but in in the case of that's because we, we have this capacity to make glu the brain. Uh, thrives best on glucose but it can use because the brain is the largest consumer of glucose in our body and uh, but it will shift over to ketones quite readily so so the whole concept is our liver will start making glucose from within now of course people say well that's why you can't kill cancer cells by lowering glucose oh no 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 because once you transition the whole body over to ketosis then you can push those blood sugar down levels down really really low just to barely measurable levels and then once you're a cancer cell and you need that glucose, lights out. You can't survive without. So, but the body has to be in therapeutic ketosis before you do that. Otherwise, you put yourself at great uh, harm for hypoglycemia, okay. hypoglycemic shock. So can, you need to have ketosis. Ketosis will prevent hypoglycemia reactions. Can you speed your entry into ketosis by perhaps going for a run or something or doing some exercise to put an energetic demand upon the body? I, I'm speaking from a preventative um, uh, sort of situation. Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question. We, we, we're, we're starting to investigate that now. The, the CrossFit uh, group is very interested in, in this. And they would, you know, they're very interested to know what the role of exercise uh, at when, at how much, when and, uh, do we use exercise as part of the therapy? And we think that's part of the uh, press concept that we that we're working on. Um, you know, how well does exercise bring us into the state of ketosis, or can we? You know, we know we can exercise while we are in therapeutic ketosis because my colleague Jeff Bolick from Ohio State University is investigating the whole role of, of ketones in, in endurance exercise. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, whether uh, the key thing is uh, your question was how fast can we get into therapeutic ketosis, and the idea is you need to you need to uh, uh, deplete your glycogen reserves because glycogen is a ready source of of uh, chains of glucose molecules that could be uh, uh, used at the ready. So, um, but it takes about 36 hours for us to get rid of the glycogen reserves, and then the body starts to make uh, glucose from gluconeogenesis, and then of course the body will make a certain level of glucose. Uh, but then it, because the brain needs so much energy, then the ketones have to be replacing the, the we can't make enough glucose internally to supply glucose for the brain. And therefore, we make ketones, which will allow the brain to function at a low on a low glucose platform. Okay. So so this is but once you're in this therapeutic zone, um, to be honest with you, I've I've tried to get to the zone. Uh, but you know, I've only done a three day water only fast and it was, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. Uh, but I, but I, I would probably have to go for a week without eating. And, um, you know, if I had cancer, I would definitely, do, I would definitely do that. At least I know, at least I know what to do. You know, it's like, it's like having the, the spare tire in your car and knowing how to use the lug wrench. You know, uh, if you had the flat, you'd know how to use it to repair the tire, but you know, you don't to repair it of a flat <laughs> <laughs> when you speak of in the zone um, what sort of level of ketones do you, do you mean are you talking about sort of three three and a half uh, yeah. and is that is that yeah. millimolar measured in millimolar yes yes, yes. so most the ketones are always measured mostly in, in millimolar not too much in milligram per deciliter like glucose is but the but the uh, yeah the ketones you know the highest I've seen on therapeutic ketosis is about nine millimolar, which is pretty high, and you have to be very careful when you get to that level. It's not that it's it's still well below what we call um, ketoacidosis, 
which is a pathological dangerous situation. And you usually see that in type 1 diabetes. Mm. Um, but uh, a, a millimolar ketone, because you start to excrete a lot of electrolytes. So electrolyte balance becomes a real uh, focal point. People will get cramps and rashes and all kinds of things. You got to be very careful if you get your ketones um, uh, up around seven, eight, or nine. But most people are exactly as you said; they're in the three to four range, millimolar range, and that's uh, usually pretty good. Um, and your blood sugar is about, you know, fifty, sixty, maybe seventy milligrams per deciliter. You can do the calculation, and you can see you're pretty close to a, a GKI of one point zero, which we have arbitrarily used a, a, as kind of a, a point of therapeutic ketosis. Okay. So uh, some people can go below. Uh, they can get down to 0 0.8, 0 0.7, um, uh, and still be. My colleague, Dominic D'Agostino, I think he got down really low, 0 0.3. You know, uh, he was he was drinking ketone solutions while not eating for four days, you know, and he could put his body into these uh, really powerful states of therapeutic ketosis. But I think most people, if they can get close to one, uh, will be will be in in, the, in a pretty good zone. So what what sort of uh, blood sugar level is that? Um, is is it or it doesn't matter? I guess exactly what it is as long as it's relatively similar um, yeah. measured in millimolar um, compared yeah. to the uh, ketone level. You're, you're absolutely right. So if you have you know if you have a lot a lot of ketones, you're up at four or five. You know your blood sugar is at seventy or eighty. I mean you could still be in therapeutic ketosis. So, um, uh, and if your blood sugar is lower you, and your ketones are, are a little bit lower, you're still in therapeutic ketosis. So you do the ratio and you find out how close to 1.0 I am, you are, and you say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm about 2.0 or whatever. Well, you're coming close to the, 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 the arbitrary uh, uh, ideal zone that we predict. And of course, you get some guys that are, they use this as a, some sort of a competition. Uh, they go on the web and they display their GKI and say, okay, guys, see if you can beat that. You know, and they're down below one and, and they look they look at me, I'm at, I'm at a point eight and I feel great. And then some other guy will come along and say, well, he'll do something. You know, it's just the human nature of, of saying, oh, but is it, is, can you get a, a GKI too low? And, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's possible. Um, because what would that mean? No glucose in your blood, only ketones, right? <laughs> yes. Well, um, Professor Seavery, this seems such empowering um, knowledge. Uh, it, it really seems to not only put health back in the hands, or potential health, back in the hands of, of everybody, but it also means it doesn't cost you any money, because, I mean, you know, obviously eating less food actually saves you money. Uh, and, I mean, my own experiments um, in and out of ketosis over, over the last five or six years, I, I've noticed that I have much more energy, I have better mental clarity, uh, better dental health, um, I, I've heard that there's increased longevity. Uh, all of these things, you know, in terms of bo uh, boosting the mitochondrial health, and then also I'm managing to reduce my risk of cancer. It, it, it sounds like a, a, a phenomenally sort of empowering, you know, good news, if you like. Well, so, I mean, it, it is, but it's also extremely challenging in an environment where um, high glycemic Oh, yeah. I mean, every one of our societies has things that taste so good, but throw you out of ketosis instantly, right? Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I was over there at Oxford eating these pork pies. Are you kidding me? You know, these things they sell you, <laughs> right? I mean, they're tasty. They throw you right out with a good big uh, thing of beer. I mean, yeah. that'll throw you out of ketosis. Totally. So, uh, but, uh, and people like that. I mean, you try to tell the guy on the street not to eat that, you know, a big, big, uh, big thing. Uh, yeah, but, so, so it's like um, you know the implementation. Then once we've got the theory, the implementation yeah, yeah. is sort of phase two, yeah. isn't it? And and I I know I've I've battled with uh, you know the whole diet thing. It is a major challenge. I think it's one of the one of the well, you know the most I, uh, personal you know personal challenges, if you like, personal development challenges to master your own diet, given the yeah, context yeah, uh, of all sugar, as you say. No, I think that's why I, I think the concept of therapeutic ketosis is one one is using it primarily to, to stay healthy. Uh, I know a lot of people are using this to lose weight. Uh, that using ketogenic diets is probably a weight loss uh, routine, but but I think the more important issue is that therapeutic ketosis puts you into a more healthy state, and you do have control of that. And it doesn't mean you have to be in that state all the time. So you just know that that this is you're right. This is something that can empower you. Um, and if you want to, you know, I always said you should try to do it on 
whatever religion a person is, almost every one of the religion, major religions have some sort of an abstinence period, you know, where you can dovetail your uh, religious experience in uh, with, a, with a state of therapeutic ketosis, which is, um, to me, it sounds like a perfect uh, a dovetailing of two different uh, uh, concepts that, that are part of the human spirit. Sure. So, and, so would, uh, that mean, would that mean you could get away with um, the, uh, the, the ketosis maybe once, twice, three times a year? Yes, absolutely. I, I don't think because I think our, our environment, our societies, people are fast paced and everything. It's very hard to be always in therapeutic ketosis unless you're some real zealot, hmm. you know, that really is rigid about this. But most people are, are, are it's, it's hard for them to do that. We, we haven't mentioned autophagy, but obviously that's a part of this nutritional ketosis process where when, when the, the, the blood sugar level drops beneath a, a certain level. It, yeah. do, is, that the, is that the sort of holy grail that you're after in this therapeutic ketosis, maybe twice yeah. a year? So, so you yeah. have, to, have to stretch the fast just long enough. Um, is it day three, day four, I believe I've heard people say, and, and, and longer in order to get into that autophagy stage where the body starts doing the clean out, ch chucking out the garbage, all the dead cells and so forth. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. And, and that usually takes a little bit longer. You might have to go to seven or 14 days before you really. And then, of course, now you're talking about, you know, uh, really, really tough. But uh, we, in my book, I called it autolytic cannibalism. But it's the same kind of thing as autophagy. What happens is the cells in our body that are incapable of surviving under, the, under a, a very rigid uh, uh, calorie restriction or uh, energetic uh, um, energy from the outside, we have to find energy from within our bodies in order to survive. And therefore, every cell in our body must contribute to the good of the whole. And if there are populations of cells or a few cells here and there that cannot match, their, they cannot maintain their energetic efficiency, they, they die and they are consumed Every one of their molecules is now consumed by the remainder of the healthy cells in the body. So we are simply recycling and re re reconfiguring, uh, the, the, as I said, the, the strong eat the weak. The weak now subserve as a fuel for the strong. And the entire body enters into a new state of physiological health. Fantastic. Now, the point, at which, the, the point at which we reach each will depend on each individual's physiology and how capable they are of reaching these, these states. And I would say that if you can maintain a, a, a GKI of 1.0 or even 0.9, a little bit below, for a period of 10 days to 14 days, you would then be enter the, entering into the state of autolytic cannibalism or autophagy. See, some, some cells will, will reconfigure their mitochondria internally, but they'll still survive. So that's autophagy. The cell will eat some of, of its internal organs to, re to survive. Autolytic cannibalism is when the cell is so de 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 decrepit and inefficient that it dies and it, like a macrophage or one of the other cells in our body will, di will digest it and redistribute the fuel throughout the rest of the body. So okay. autolytic cannibalism and autophagy are just simple, uh, are different stages of the same phenomenon. Okay. Do you think that there's any role for vegetarianism or vegan diets? You know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that, that uh, advocate the, the plant-based diet. Uh, therapeutically for cancer and, and in some respects for optimal health in general. Do, do you, is there any evidence that supports that or, or well, is I it mean, sufficient if, to do what you've already outlined? I, I would say if, if you're a vegan and you are on a vegan diet, then measure your GKI and see because there are some vegetables that have a high glycemic index and they'll throw you out of they'll throw you out of ketosis. So it's like anything. I mean, it, you, there are there are low glycemic meats and there are, you know, most meats are uh, well, that's not true because if you eat too much protein, the protein can be can be metabolized to sugar through the process of gluconeogenesis. So that's why uh, uh, diets that have too much meat can throw you out of ketosis. So Atkins diet is not the same as a ketogenic diet. Even though you're making ketones from an Atkins diet, your blood sugars are often higher. Keto keto diets have lower blood sugar, and you can get easy, easier into therapeutic ketosis with a with a ketogenic diet than you can with an Atkins diet. Okay. And I, I agree. I think there's some plants and vegetables that are ideally suited for maintaining therapeutic ketosis, but not all of them. Hmm. And each individual would have to test that for themselves. I mean, uh, the, the Gerson therapy, I remember, was, was sort of advocating juicing and sort of high minerals and vitamins to make sure that the body's adequately fueled with what it needs as well. Um, yeah. I, I assume that you'd probably go along with things like that. But, but the, with, the, with the, the, uh, the vegan and the vegetarian um, idea, sometimes that might actually have a lower 
fat content might it might be difficult to keep the fats up. I would I would imagine um, well, to stay in ketosis. But if you have avocados and certain kinds of nuts and things like that, you can oh, bring true. the fat. You know, you, there's there's uh, the my colleagues uh, have written some beautiful books on uh, the dietary uh, um, approach to this. Um, you know, uh, Ellen Davis, uh, um, Maria, uh, Miriam Kalamian. Um, you know, uh, a number of these people have written all these beautiful books that uh, uh, give you an array of foods that can maintain uh, in therapeutic ketosis. So it's an emerging field, and I think that uh, the food industry and a lot of dietary groups are, are realizing, you know, what are the combinations of foods that we can take um, to, uh, uh, to bring us to therapeutic ketosis and also uh, help with our compliance. Because, you know, compliance, you want to stay in the zone, but if I'm eating all kinds of stuff that I hate, yeah, I'm going to fall out of the zone. So, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole uh, a process. Gotcha. So um, just very briefly, I'm, I'm aware that we're running on, out of time, but um, which particular form of, of ketone measuring do you use? Is there, is there a ketone meter that, that, that you think is, is the best form? It's got, to be, it's got to be a blood measurement, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there are three, well, there's several different forms. That we, we've used the Precision Extra by Abbott, uh, Abbott Labs. They, and you can buy the ketone strips uh, and glucose strips on Amazon. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that the, the meter is not terribly expensive. You know, it's like mm. $35. Uh, the consumables are, are what yeah, usually yeah. cost the most. It's and now true. there's the new Keto Mojo. Um, the Keto Mojo is a, uh, a, new, a new meter and the strips are cheaper. And um, there are other meters. I haven't checked, checked them out. But we're doing an experiment right now in my lab where I'm testing uh, uh, clinical chemistry uh, enzyme assays for glucose and ketones compared with the precision extra compared with the keto mojo okay so we want we want the three different uh, measurements in in mice that are maintained on high carbohydrate diets and mice that are maintained on calorie restricted ketogenic diets and then we'll measure glucose and ketones and calculate the gki under these different diets using the three different meters uh, procedures that we would have and then if we can publish this it will give the population uh, people in the world uh, uh, a measure to know that you know they can use this or use that and this is how it would compare so um, I think that will be valuable information for people mm. that would be wanting to go down this path okay and and finally I mean what sort of uh, assuming that the the knowledge of cancer being a metabolic disease um, is, is is taken up by um, you know sufficient people what sort of percentage of cancer cases do you think can be prevented um, you know by people simply changing their dietary cho choices well, what's, what's the potential there to well, um, Otto Warburg uh, predicted that 80 percent of all cancers could be reduced by um, um, by diet or or putting I don't think he knew about therapeutic ketosis but he felt that 80 percent of cancers could be uh, prevented if one were to know how to enhance uh, the respiratory system of the cell, which is basically therapeutic ketosis. We, he didn't know how to do that. He just predicted that. Now we have a, we have a, a tool and a system to actually do that. So I think at least 70% of all cancers can probably be 70 to 80. I agree with what Warburg said um, on, 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 preventing, on preventing cancer. What was the second part of the question? Uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, no, that was it. Um, you know, what okay. percentage of people? Um, I mean, obviously, the uptake challenge we, we've discussed. <laughs> it's very difficult yeah, to persuade yeah. people to change their diets. But uh, but yeah, I think yeah. the good news but, that, that but, I'm well. The, the other issue, of course, is you know um, not only preventing cancer, uh, but you know how how much can we lower the death rate by? Yes. Okay, this is I think is a really important thing because um, you know most people don't don't that we all roll the dice. We all think we're not going to be the one to get the, the cancer, but we do, uh, some of us and some people. And, okay, now I have it. What am I going to do? Now, right now we have, an, as you've mentioned at the beginning of the program, what an abysmal state we're in. Cancer uh, incidence is rising out of control, and the death rate is going up in all societies. Um, so clearly whatever we're doing isn't working. So uh, the idea, though, with uh, metabolic therapy as a, as a therapy, not only uh, therapeutic ketosis as a prevention, but metabolic therapy as, a, as, a, as an approach to managing. I think we can reduce the death rate by 50% if people in 10, 20 years, um, maybe even less if we, if we, if people could, could 
get rid of the dogmatic view that cancer is a genetic disease and stop all this nonsense with all these expensive immunotherapies and all this kind of stuff mm-hmm. and, and go for metabolic approaches. I think we can not only uh, drop the, uh, uh, reduce reduce the new cases by 50%, but I also think we can drop the death rate by 50%. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be an enormous achievement. I mean, um, uh, people would emerge from this healthier than when they started. I mean, we, we had a, in our Press Pulse paper that was open access, we outlined the framework for how this would all work. And now it's up to the medical community and the physicians to implement these strategies in their patients. And, and, the, and the group in Turkey and the group in Alexandria, Egypt, and several other groups in Hungary, they're starting to do this now, and they're getting unbelievable results. So clearly this can work. It's just that you have to educate people to know how to do it. Sure. Well, well, I hope that uh, you know that the message uh, of, of this show is to is to uh, inform people that they they do have choices um, above and beyond the uh, conventional standard of care, and and there are all, there is a, a major alternative which makes far more rational sense, which you've helped um, help them see today. So, uh, very many thanks for that, uh, Professor Seyfried. Um, fantastic message, and uh, um, thank you so much for for joining us on the show and giving us your time today. Uh, this is this is so important. As I said, so many of us have lost loved ones through cancer. And from what you're saying, this is preventable, it's avoidable, and it's treatable and manageable. So um, fantastic news. I really appreciate your time, Professor Seyfried. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure and, to be here. And uh, for all of you listening, I do hope you've got some value from the show today. I recommend, well, it's rather a pricey book, but I recommend if you wish to look into this further, um, Professor Seyfried's book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease on the Origin, Management and Prevention of Cancer. Um, Would I be right in assuming it's a a textbook, isn't it, uh, Professor? I haven't got a copy myself. Yeah, no, it's a combination of of, uh, text with information. I have to be honest with you, it was written primarily for the investigators in the field. Sure. Uh, But if people, but there are chapters in there that are very relevant to the person. And also, Keto for Cancer is probably the most practical book uh, for uh, people that want to adapt this by Miriam Kalami, and it's called Keto for Cancer. And then Travis Kirstofferson's book, Tripping Over the Truth, uh, The Rise of the Metabolic Theory of Cancer. These are more for the layperson. They can understand. They easily adapt the, these kinds of books. Marvelous. Thank you so much for, for those recommendations. And uh, to all you listeners, I do hope you've uh, got some value out of this. And, uh, you know, I hope that it inspires you to question things in the mainstream because so often, uh, more often than not, I have found that if we simply go along with what we hear in the news, we are, we're not really going to avail ourselves to, to all the possibilities to, to empower ourselves and, uh, and live the thriving lives we want to. So I hope you got some value for this and I do hope you'll join me again for another episode of Living Outside the Matrix. Changing.